selfish ambition and my pride I'm giving up, I'm letting die Good morning everyone. Good morning and nice to see you. And so as we all gather into this room and welcome for those who are joining us virtually, uh, are reaching out that way and um, connecting with us. So you're all very welcome this morning. So we'll, we'll just give a few seconds for some royal ladies to take their seats. Good. Hope you're all having a nice morning and um, ready just to, to join with us in whatever way that is and uh, join with us as the team lead us in song, as we uh, just encourage one another and as we uh, just take time to listen uh, to what maybe the Spirit of God wants to say to us this morning. It's good when people gather together. It's good for our very beings to be together, to smile at one another, to encourage one another, to laugh with one another and also to cry with one another, to encourage one another and to just uplift each other wherever we see uh, necessary. So let's try and do that this morning in this short time that we have together. Let me give you our announcements for this week. So uh, tonight we're going to be connecting together again on Zoom. Uh, we'll put the details up on the WhatsApp group. And uh, tonight we were going to hear from a couple uh, from Banbridge. Also, they previously lived in Canada, uh, Paul and Fiona Coles. And we're really looking forward to hearing their story and their journey of how God has led them here to Northern Ireland and what God is leading them in at the moment. And uh, just the changes that they have found as they have adapted to just a new way of living. So we're really looking forward to that and really want to encourage you to join in with us at half eight. It'll be from half eight to half nine, uh, somewhere around that sort of time, and it'll be great to hear in their story. And then the other announcement, I've only two announcements uh, this morning, and then the other announcement that I have is, ladies, you are all getting together here tomorrow night, and uh, there will be a very warm welcome for you. Uh, uh, here and there'll be some uh, nice wee fussies and uh, whatever else uh, uh, you ladies are enjoy to eat. Fussy is uh, like some type of food, I think. M maybe I just made that one up. Anyway, if you're from the country and you're a bit more, it's like a bit of supper. A wee bit of supper. So ladies, come along. I think this is your final night kind of officially uh, of the year. Uh, so over the summer, you'll just not be as meeting as much. So come along and encourage one another. Have a smile uh, with each other. And uh, again, uh, just, just, just be together. So that's the announcements. Got a short, uh, Daniel's got a short video for us here um, just to help us with some thoughts. And so Daniel, you play that video. Dear Mordecai, here's to you on Father's Day. You cared for Esther as if she were your own daughter. You committed to her and helped her see her place in God's purpose. Happy Father's Day to you and to all who encourage children to reach their full potential. Dear David, here's to you on Father's Day. You made space at your table for Mephibosheth and welcomed him into your home. You assured him that he mattered and made sure he was cared for throughout his life. Happy Father's Day to you and to all who make space for those society often shut out. Dear prophets, here's to you on Father's Day. You had the courage to call out injustice. You spoke up for the poor, the oppressed and the vulnerable. You pushed for change and you brought a message of hope. Happy Father's Day to you and to all the thinkers, speakers, writers, and doers pursuing justice and influencing change. Dear Joseph, here's to you on Father's Day. You stood by Mary and loved and raised Jesus as your son. Happy Father's Day to you and to every dad, 
stepdad, granddad, foster dad, and guardian who are raising children with love. Dear Jairus, here's to you on Father's Day. You went to great lengths to help your daughter when she was sick. You ran to seek help from Jesus, refusing to give up even when those around you said it was too late. Happy Father's Day to you and to all who choose hope where others see hopelessness. Dear Paul, here's to you on Father's Day. You are a spiritual father to Timothy, a mentor, and you pointed him to Jesus. You helped him lead others. Happy Father's Day to you and to every teacher, mentor, youth worker, and coach who are helping others to grow. Here's to you all on Father's Day. You are making a difference. We pray today for fathers, for new dads and granddads and stepdads and adoptive dads and solo dads, for baldy ones and beardy ones, skinny ones and cuddly ones, for dads who tell terrible jokes and dads who dance to YMCA, for dads who know how to fix things and dads who just pretend they know how to fix things. Fathers to the fatherless, we pray for those for whom this day is sadder than it is happy those who feel they have failed, those who are grieving children they never had, those missing their dads or their kids even more than usual. Thank you, Tamar. Let's continue to pray. Father of mercy, heal our many hurts and restore dignity, integrity, and the cent centrality of fatherhood in our families in our communities and in our nations. As Paul the Apostle said, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that you may know love. And finally, Lord, for all those poor souls everywhere who forgot that this is Father's Day, we would ask that you would bless them in abundant grace and manifold mercy. Amen. So uh, Paul and Judith and Jenna are going to come and lead us in a time of singing and praise and worship. And uh, come on ahead and do that. Um, thank you. Nicola, just in case Jenna's watching this and panicking. <laughs> Jenna.
All right, as uh, Neil makes his way up, Andrew and Neil, or we're going to do what we normally do every couple of weeks, every three or four weeks together. We um, want to hear really uh, how God is, how we're digesting uh, what God is speaking. Uh, and so it's great to have Andrew, and uh, um, Neil's going to come and do an interview. I just felt I should pray with you both this morning. Uh, not that you both need it, but uh, uh, um, but let's pray. You take your seat there, Neil, and I'll pray. Father, we thank you, and uh, thank you even just for the words of that last song that we sang together. You have never, ever let us down. You have been with us um, in so many different times of our lives when we didn't have enough and we even didn't seem as if we were enough and yet you came through with your grace and your mercy and uh, and so father just i pray for ourselves more than actually i pray for these two men i pray lord that you would just give us ears to hear what you want to say to us this morning give us hearts that are open and lord i just pray that as we as we listen that you would cultivate deep within our hearts just uh what you're what, what you want to do uh, with each one of us, what you want to say to each one of us. I thank you for Andrew, uh, and I thank you for Neil. Amen. Before I begin, um, or before you begin, PD had a great gag prepared. He was going to come up here and pretend to be me, but that I, tr oh. but that I shrank. Hey, that would be you going to come and pretend to be me? Yeah. <laughs> oh, look at this. Good boy. It's very... <coughs> say something that your daddy would say. I think... Who wants to play uh, hide and seek with me outside? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's uh, oh, Andrew, Andrew, you're too old. You're too old for hide and seek, uh -huh. Andrew. That, that's a good move to try and get church to end early. Right, go sit down. <laughs> <laughs> good boy. Just play first. We could be one of those night. churches. <laughs> we could be one of those churches that sort of plays silent music in the background while we are speaking um <laughs> thanks thanks to the guys for leading us it was beautiful um just before we go on i if it's all right andrew i am um, i was just so struck by this quote from j.i packer during the week and um over the last few years i've just become so much more conscious of how um how difficult this day can be for people within our church family, within our community, and, uh, and there's times I, f I f feel like how to know what to, how to even respond and react to days like today in some ways. And um, and I got the opportunity this week to spend uh, spend an hour or two with with um, with our church family, with a part of the bride of Christ across uh, Asia, with friends from Bangladesh and Nepal and India. And um, we just had a great time sort of talking around this revelation of God as Father. And there's some, there's some things that trigger within people that, that make, maybe make this difficult. But J.I. Packer has this quote, and I just find it so profound. It is one of those places that I go back to regularly over and over again. When he says you sum up the whole of New Testament religion, if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's Holy Father, and so if you, want to if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. And the quote goes on, our understanding of Christianity cannot be better than our grasp of adoption. And I... I don't say I don't share that quote just as an isolated quote because it's Father's Day. I think that is part that will maybe th be uh, one of the threads that we might pull out of 
our, our conversation here this morning um, when it comes to stuff around identity, which Amy took us through uh, three weeks ago. So just to make sure that we all know what, remember what we're doing, uh, I and, and we are increasingly passionate about, about changing the, what our Sunday mornings constantly feeling like a monologue, but trying to change it into a dialogue. And, um, and so that's why these mornings are really important for me. They're challenging in many ways because you're, you're giving up some sort of control. Uh, you don't have the, the, your 30 minute presentation to, to run off. Who knows what I might say? I know exactly, that is, that is the thing. An extra loss of control with, with the Andrew in that fancy shirt. Um, so let, let's, let's go back. It mightn't be as, it mightn't be as neat, as, neat and tidy as going through. Uh, so Amy, uh, Amy took us through this, this idea of resilience three weeks ago. And then two weeks ago, Glenn Mitchell from Tear Fund talked about walking and um, walking with the poor and the marginalised, and, um, and we'll we'll probably touch on that. And then last week I talked about the forgiving way of God. So those are the three weeks that we've had, and, and so now we just have this opportunity to pause, hear what it is that we have been hearing and hopefully learning together. Um, so Andrew, thank you so much for 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 doing this, for helping us as we. Work, continue to work this all out together as family. Do you want? Do you want to just start? Do you want to just kick off what you're? Yeah. We think we have some thoughts around where Amy took us mm -hmm. three weeks ago. So why don't you start and uh, and we'll yeah. see we'll see where we go from there. Okay. Um. In no particular order, I suppose as well. Um. The funny thing, whenever you asked me to speak, um, or did talk to you today is I didn't actually remember anything from the last couple of weeks. Okay. I don't know if anyone else is like that, <laughs> but I definitely, you have to come sometimes like really sit and think, what was that actually about? And then, you know, it does start coming back to you. Mm -hmm. um, and especially some, sometimes it's, it's more like the, the, the sentiment than the actual, the detail. Yeah. Um, but that idea of resilience, that, that idea of, of um, um, you know, the difficulties that we face in our journey, um, our, 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 I can't remember who, who the quote was from. You, you mentioned it, um, like how God might be more interested in the process than in the end result. Not me, and Amy. Amy, uh, but you told me that yesterday. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's really, I think that's really powerful. And I was actually reminded of that, strangely enough, um, through reading something work-related earlier in the week. There was an interview um, that Tim Cook from Apple gave um, and talk about the success of the company. Uh, and he said that um, quite often people think that success is the opposite of failure. It's like a very common adage people have, but in their perspective, success is actually the culmination of many failures. Uh, and I kind of thought, you know, that actually, that is quite like our, our lives and our journeys. You know, it's, we, we tend to learn more from our failures. And in the times where we feel like we're failing or you know, where things are going badly, that is when we do rely on the Lord more um, and, and can sometimes strengthen our faith and help us go on into the next challenge. Uh, and a, li a lot of what Amy talked about that and that journey with, um, with Hannah, um, you know, of, you know, and all the things that she went through, you know, to finally get to that answer to prayer at, at the end. Um, and then... You know, and that had strengthened her faith so that when Sammy was old enough, she'd give him back to the Lord like she said she would. Um, so I think, like, I do, th I think there's, I think that was really powerful. Yeah. So just so you, you all remember, um, there, there was that question Amy asked that I still remember. And so I'm like you, like, I don't remember because we're all, we're all the same. Like, by Wednesday, what, it's, by Wednesday, if we're just, if we're with, Learning is simply by listening to somebody speak for 30 minutes. We'll only retain uh, about three or four or five percent of it by the time it gets to Wednesday. Yeah. So, um, but this is one thing that I'd love us to continue to hold on to is this question. What if God is more interested in the journey? What if he is more interested in the process than the end result? Yeah, I don't, I don't even think it's a question. I think it, it's an absolute. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't make sense to me if, if it was the end result. You know, it's that's not what we're asked to do. It's mm -hmm. not what um, what he calls us for. You know, I mean, maybe some people see salvation and getting into heaven. That's the end result. But there's all that time in the middle. Yeah. You know, and that's 
you, you can't just be saved and then do nothing mm -hmm. for the rest of your life. Um, yeah, so, so, I, so I think I agree with you. But I think as we, why it's important for us is that then how we engage with our community and how we engage mm -hmm. with our family, can we say the same thing about us? Yeah. What would it look like if we were more interested in the journey and the process than we were about getting them to say a prayer or sign a card or, yeah. you know what I mean? What would, what would like walking with people look like if we truly were more focused on the process, walking through the pain and the questions and the doubts and the failures? What if we were more interested in that than we were about the end result? It might, ch it might change something in our discipleship and in our evangelism and all of that. Yeah. You know, if you if your if your end goals, you know, are to have the you know the the Instagram family or the you know the perfect church, you mm -hmm. know, you can you can certainly do that. But what do you lose on the way? Mm -hmm. So the idea of resilience again, what Amy talked about, was that part of resilience is actually focusing on the journey so much more than the outcome. Yeah. Um. And so. So again, we don't I don't want to prod too much, but. But we do maybe want to talk about that, that idea that, um, as Amy brought us through the story of Hannah, she talked about there are seasons that we have where pain is part of the journey. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you've thought in and around that? Um, I definitely agree with that. When yeah. she said that, you know, I, I thought back to different periods of my life where um, they were very difficult, where I wouldn't want to go back to them. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I now can find find a form of joy, you know, in, in looking at how I was helped through it and how, you know, and how, how God helped me through it and how, you know, my family and friends helped me through it um, and how, you know, maybe strengthened our relationship or strengthened us as a family. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th those things are invaluable. It was definitely a difficult time, but, but it made things better. Very good. Um, so on that, um, just continue to, to stay around th th that thought for a moment. Um, if I can just share the story really quickly that I shared with you out mm -hmm. there, and if there's anything more you want to add to it, uh, please do. But I was telling Andrew out in the out in the room there that I read a story about Blaise Pascal this week, and he's like a 17th century mathematician philosopher. I don't know what else he was. I think he was a theologian, actually. He, it's and a he very had, cool name as well. Blaise Pascal. Yeah. That? Nobody did forget that. No. People still remember that name as we finished. There, there'll today. be a test. Seventeenth <laughs> <laughs> century philosopher, theologian. That's what you'll be asked, tested on. But he had this. He had this. Uh, he had this encounter with God. And um, so the book that I, the book that I've been reading at the minute is called Hunting for Magic, Magic Eels. It's a really fun title. But speaking about these encounters that people had with God, and um, and so Blaise Pascal had this two-hour encounter where he just experienced what he described as the fire of God, and uh, and it was so specific. It was from half ten to half twelve on a particular date in the early seventeen hundreds, and um, and what he acknowledged and what the author of the book that I'm reading acknowledged is that there's experiences and encounters, beautiful experiences, beautiful revelations that we have of the goodness of God, of the father heart of God, of, of just like radical encounters. But he acknowledged that they are transitory, that they are, sh they are short lived. Mm -hmm. And so what do we do with that? And so the, the writer of this book talked about um, how these sacred truths that are revealed, the things that we experience, how do we carry them forward? How do we hold on to these sacred truths in those moments that need to be carried forward? Because the truth is that there will be seasons where, where God will go quiet. There'll be seasons where it feels like he is absent. And during those seasons, um, when how do we... Uh, how do we create the discipline of memory? And so what Blaise Pascal had done, he had, he had written down this whole encounter, what he felt was being unveiled, what was, what was being revealed to him, and he wrote, wrote it all down, handwritten, and he had it stitched to his jacket. And so in those seasons of pain, in those seasons where everything else had gone quiet, he held close to the encounter. 
He held really tightly to the revelation. The discipline of memory became so important to him that he was able to, to, uh, to be resilient. He was able to hold on to who he was and who God was in seasons of pain and quietness and seeming absence. And, um, and there's something about that that I, that I just felt was, was really important for me. And as we were thinking about resilience and resilience in identity, that we can so often be waiting for the next big moment, the next big encounter. But actually, what would it be like to, to, uh, to engage our memory, to hold on to this discipline of memory that will allow us to remain resilient in those seasons of pain? Does that make sense? Yeah. Discipline of memory. That's, uh, I remember that. Um, well, it was only 15, 20 minutes ago, Andrew. Yeah. It was, I'm talking about like 15, 30 seconds ago. Oh. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, actually, discipline of memory is, um, <laughs> so, so a lot of people don't know this, um, uh, and I don't talk about it very much, and I probably should talk about it more, but as an adult, I was diagnosed as having ADHD, and, and some of you remember saying, that explains a lot, um, right now, and, and to me, personally, that explains a lot. Um, it doesn't excuse a lot of things, but it does explain a lot of things. Um, so discipline of memory is actually something that I, I really struggle with, um, and I was... And ironically, I've forgotten who said it or where I heard it or read it. But um, <laughs> about a month ago, somebody somewhere um, mentioned about how um, they're, they're different theologians um, have been considering that, um, you know, just looking at behaviors of, of people in the Bible, that there's a thought that Peter, the, the disciple, the apostle of Peter, um, may have had some form of ADHD just based on his behavior. And I think it was, it was somebody, oh, I know who it was, it was somebody at Teo, um, Teo Associates, oh, yes, okay. um, was talking about this. Uh, and they were saying, just the, the things that Peter did, you know, how he could be one moment, you know, literally riding the waves, you know, walking oh. into Jesus, and then say, oh, what was that? And then falls. Um, or, you know, Jesus tells everyone to be calm, but he decides he's going to, you know, take out his sword and, you know, go for the soldier. Yes. Um, and it, it's you know, very, very you know, typical ADHD behaviors there um but I, I did find that very interesting and uh yeah it's it's um what we're we talking about <laughs> we're joking um so yes being able to remember is is it is it is very important and, and i like that you know but you know he's he's written it in you know he's carrying it with him everywhere um it was making me think about how you know, there's these there's these experiences that we have in our lives that are just so traumatic I said, maybe is the right word like things that are for good or for bad um like you think about experiences where people came face to face with with god in the bible how you, you know, moses's face was shining you know and there's different experiences people had you know some people dropped dead you know the the experience of coming face to face with god was such a majestic and overwhelming thing and, and in, like in our lives we have experiences whether and whether that is an experience with god or just experiences in life for good or for bad, sometimes they become so, they're, they're, they're just so emotionally traumatic that we can't even explain them. And you know, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of books have been written, you know, people, um, you know, they turn to, to art, to music, um, they write stories, they write films, you know, to try and explain this, because it is like a, you know, a picture paints a thousand words. Um, you know, and even like, you know, like allegorical works like Pilgrim's Progress or the Narnia books, you know, that's a writer has tried to explain this really complicated idea um, in a way that we can relate to. Um, and, and, and actually, you know, um, uh, and I, I, was, I was like, who else? Um, Tolkien is another writer and contemporary of um, C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. So he wrote The Lord of the Rings. And Whereas C.S. Lewis was writing the Narnia books, you know, about, uh, about Christianity and faith and belief, um, Tolkien wrote those books about war, mm -hmm. and so some of the experiences that he had in First World War, and so you know, again, so you're seeing two different types of allegory. There's one allegory about faith and hope and love, and then there's another allegory about like the trauma of war, about how yes, people can battle through. Um, and spoilers for anyone that hasn't read or watched Lord of the Rings yet, but as um, as Frodo takes the room, the not room, the ring, and then destroys it at the end, he's never the same again because that trauma has stayed with him. And and that was talking talking about how um, you know just that experience through 
three, you know, the three books, three movies, if, if that's the way you're inclined, um, has, has changed him and he'll never be the same again and he can never go back to the life that he had before. And although that was something, you know, the idea that was behind was, was about trauma, it's still a very powerful thought about how, you know, our experiences do change us. We're not the same people at the end. Um, we can't, as much as we might like to, go backwards. Um, you know, in the, um, can I talk more about Lord of the Rings? Is that all right? All right. You and have the Frodo had the ring. You have the room, as you. Have the, room. <laughs> you have the room, Andrew. Type of well, and with great, great power comes great respect. No, that's not Lord of the Rings. Um, so, okay, so. Without being too nerdy about Lord of the Rings here, so at one point Frodo, um, Frodo goes back home after he's destroyed the ring. Again, spoilers, um, and you know he just can't connect with people anymore. He can't go back to that simple life. As, you know, he's he has had this new revelation of how the world works, and uh, again, for good or for bad, um, and you know, and he decides that then he can't live there anymore, and he has to, you know, in, in the books they talk about sail off west to the you know, to the land of the elves. Um, but it's you know it's he can't he can't you can't go home again, and and that's definitely something I think in our journeys in our Christian walks that we definitely experience, you know, um, because it's not just the process it's it's a how it changes us mm. and what we learn from it, and you we might long for those simpler days you know, those early days of faith. Um, where you know you could, oh you just felt this mighty working. Sometimes it's just you should long for younger days whenever you you know, you didn't feel like everything hurt when you stood up. Um, but <laughs> you know so maybe it's age as well as the journey. But you know you do feel like going back to those days would be great. Like do you remember you know do you remember all the things we did? You know like youth groups or or mission trips and you know all the great experiences we had. And you tried to do that again now it just wouldn't work because you're a different person. But that, that, you know, that molding of you as a person is God's intention because you know, then you can do greater things. You're, yeah. you're always learning from that. Very good. Um, yeah, that's deep and rich. Um, and say, but in saying that, there's still... Do you know, like you have, I know you've thought a wee bit about identity. Um, and so, like there are, there are, there is the seasons of the pain. There is the experiences that do ultimately change us. But there still feels there's something around identity that does still ground us in some way. Mm -hmm. That still, like there is still something to root us that we can't, so that we're not like through every season of pain or every, like we're still being grounded in something. Yes, and I, I think identity is one of those, like one of those. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it helps. It helps form what our identity is. Because mm -hmm. um, I know, like you know, even who, who we think of ourselves or what we think of ourselves changes through life. I know last week you talked about forgiveness, and whenever you talked about that, I was actually like already writing down, um, you know, should we forgive ourselves? And then you said it um, because I actually think that's something because it's not only you know how we see others and treat others, but actually how do we see and treat ourselves? Yeah. Um, and you know, I think to be to be authentic, to be your authentic self, you do have to know who you are. You have to know what you believe. You you have to be okay with asking questions, having doubts, having you know bad spells, yeah. having good spells, um, and, and and realize that all of that is is what makes you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think in terms of identity, being self aware is probably the most important thing. Yeah. Do you want to talk a bit more about that? I don't know. I think it's just because I think it's, I think it's good. Like just, I think, like I think, self awareness is like a, it's a under appreciated, um, under appreciated value. But why I want, it, like, why I'm still standing around this idea of being like resilient. Because Amy used the language concerning Hannah, resilience, resilient in her identity. And for me, that's part of my experience. My my experiences when it comes to the things of God or encountering God are very rarely like moments where like. Um, lying on the floor or something that ha has happened to me physically it's more of a it's more like a of a revelation mm -hmm. and so um, the key thing for me has been revelation about my identity and an assurance of God's love yeah 
So it's the same, and, and I love that that's how even Jesus begins his ministry, with this unveiling, with this um, recognizing and moving into the world with an assurance of the Father's approval and his and love. Mm -hmm. his, his encounter at his baptism, the Father, before he'd done anything, uh, spoke over Jesus, this is my son who I love, and in him I am well pleased. And that becomes the thing that even though I have seasons, experiences of pain and failure, whenever that is, whenever I'm rooted in that, that the Father approves me, that he is for me, as we've sang, and not against me, that, uh, that goes a long way to developing um, resilience in the seasons mm -hmm. of pain. Well, that, that revelation of you know, just like, discovering something new from something you're reading, I definitely find that. I was reading, uh, what I said to you there earlier about this, um, Second Timothy. So um, Paul's writing to Timothy. It's kind of the end of the, the, the second letter. And, and I definitely read that in a new way um, this week as a father than I probably would have before I had children because I definitely was reading it seeing Paul as a father figure to Timothy. And I know that came up in the yeah. video as well. But I'm, I'm going to read it real quick. Um, so this is Second Timothy, um, starting at, I think, it's chapter 4, it's starting second or third verse. Um, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And, well, I mean, that sounds very, like, these days, doesn't it? Um, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. So it really does feel like a goodbye, like it does feel like, you know, Paul, Paul more so than me standing up and feeling pain, um, is, is kind of just exhausted. You know, he's he definitely had a lot harder life than I have. At that point in his life, and uh, and you know he's passing that wisdom on to Timothy. It's like you know the you know the last thing he's sharing with him, um, and I, I definitely f thought seen that and thought about legacy and about the legacy that we leave for our children. You know what sort of example mm -hmm. are we setting? Yep. Which is a very different thing than I would have thought about you know eleven twelve years ago. Um, you know Lila and I joke about how before we had Tamar, you know I was even uncomfortable with being called dad. It's like, I don't want to be called dad. It's like, you just call me Andrew. That's really weird. Why would you want that? I mean, that's not what happened. And for anyone who does that, that's fine too. But um, yeah, that was, that was just like, that was where I was. And, and it's, so my journey as a father has, you know, because I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, don't know. Do you, you know now? No, Pass. no. Yeah. I've just gotten better at pretending. <laughs> um, just bluff with confidence. That's, that's, that's the secret. Better at pretending, that's a good line, though. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like even you know, knowing how. To, so like Tamar, she was, she's obviously the eldest, so she's the practice one. And then the other two are perfect. Um, <laughs> I, I had to get her back, because whenever um, last night she wanted me to prep, she did say that Neil's going to ask you who you are. Uh, and then she was trying to prep Neil on this earlier as well. Um, she says, he's going to ask you who you are and tell, tell me a bit about yourself. And you have to tell him that you've got one beautiful child and two bad ones. Um. Did she say that? <laughs> Tamar. Tamar, what other, what other, I forget all the prep you give me. It was really helpful. How are we, are we getting on all right? Is there anything, any questions that you're thinking about that would be helpful to ask now? No? Um. Tamar was really helpful to the point where she's uh, she's going to do the next one, interviewing, aren't you? <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, if you have anything more about, around that, you can come back to it. But I want to move quickly. We'll take another few minutes here, conscious of time. All of a sudden, but then um, Glenn brought us Glenn brought us through Luke chapter four. Um, I suppose he was speaking about the work that the Tear Fund were were doing across the world and mentioned about walking with the poor and walking with the marginalized, asking that big, big question, what is the church for? Um, and so I, I loved how he closed it out by actually, what the, as we begin to answer that question, the role of the church is to address issues of injustice. That is a true sign of the kingdom. It's a beautiful sign of the mm -hmm. kingdom. And, um, and so one of the things that I wanted, was reflecting on even after it asked you to do this, was even just to speak a wee bit and remind everybody your job. Transponster. 
Is that what you do? Um, <laughs> what your job is, I think, is a beautiful sign of the kingdom. Mm-hmm. So it's addressing imbalance. It's it's a uh, it's it's addressing injustices within yeah. within the media, within accessibility, and all of that. And so. If you remind people just a wee bit of what you yeah. do, but how that is for you, like a sign of the kingdom, how that is a like revealing the Father's heart of love to to everyone. Yeah. So so what I do is, um, officially the title is accessibility consultant. There you go. Um, so what I do is I work with different clients who make websites and apps and really anything that you would have on a computer. Um, I try to steer them in a direction that will mean that their product will work for people with disabilities. Um, you know, and that's, that's trying, to, trying to cater for all disabilities. Um, so for some things, that's easier than, than others. Um, and for some c- companies and some clients, that's easier than others. Um, but it is a, it is a constant battle um, because to do things properly costs money. Um, I often, I, equate what I do, it's a bit like being a, um, maybe like a building inspector um, or, or something like that where, you know, you can build a house, you know, without getting planning permission or without even having an architect design plans. It might fall down. You know, maybe you decided to build it on the sand. Um, it might not. But if you get caught, you're probably going to be in trouble because there are building regulations for a reason to try and, you know, make structures safe and keep people safe. And so I'm kind of like that, but for the internet, um, because people, I mean, believe it or not, people can actually be harmed from a bad website. You know, a really easy example to understand is how having something flashing like an animation on your site can trigger epilepsy. Mm-hmm. You know, and just because your designer thought, oh, it looked cool to have something flashing, doesn't mean you should do it. You know, if someone stuck their head in the fire, you know, would you do it? Um, I actually use that as an example with a designer earlier in the week because they wanted to do something that looked really good that everyone else did. And I had to say, no, just, just hold on. Just because it's a trend doesn't mean you need to do it. Uh, and so a lot of what I do is it's, it's part um, you know, investigation. You're doing a lot of kind of like digging to try and find what problems might occur. Um, try to put myself in the shoes of somebody with a disability, you know, somebody who's blind or somebody with um, limited mobility how would they use a computer, how would they use their phone to browse the web, and what sort of things might get in the way, and then go back to people and say, okay, this is what you need to fix, this is what you need to change. So there's definitely like a teaching element of it as well. Um, And all of that you're trying to balance with trying to be pragmatic because you don't want to say to the company, and it's going to cost you another 10,000 pounds, which in some cases it will, but you have to try and spin it in a way that um, that they're going to, you know, well, that they can't, legally some of them can't say no. (laughs) But, um, but they still try. Yes. Yeah, so what I, what I've appreciated about it is how you're like restoring the the value and the dignity of everyone, like, yeah. and I think that's so important. It's definitely. I mean, it, it's it's. I don't feel. I don't. I don't immediately feel like I'm doing something, you know, for you know, for the kingdom. But I know you've used that language before, and when I stop and think about it, you know, it is. You are helping people. You know, to me, I'm just doing doing my job. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think because you're, adri- but, I think whenever wherever we are, whenever you're addressing issues of injustice, mm-hmm. and you're trying to redress the imbalance of power and bias or whatever it looks like, I think that's exactly what Jesus yeah. was all about, and he spent so much of his time doing that. And so, because your role is in that, like we all we all can do that. Mm. We're just highlighting that role that you do, but we all have a responsibility and an ab- ability to be able to. Yeah. to do that you don't get a you don't get a lot of uh, opportunity to kind of you know share the gospel per se in what i'm doing but you definitely get to share morality yeah. you know because that that is one of the other things as well as you know the legal reason to do some of this stuff that the companies have to do you, you you know i do get the opportunity to say but like you know what if it was you know your parents what if it was you what if it was your children yeah. um you know think about the people that that your choices are, are affecting mm-hmm. um, and trying to put, you know, try to just get people to think outside of themselves again, which I think is a lot of you know, the other stuff we've been talking about as well. You know, that's a, that's a big thing in, in, in how we treat others is you know, just look outside of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the big thing for you. The takeaway, I think that was the first thing you mentioned whenever I'd say I'd asked you 
is there a particular direction you want to take this this morning and tr the treatment of others was yeah. was the big thing yeah because i think everything else informs that because it's again it's your you know your journey your identity and yeah. um, you know how you show forgiveness uh, and how you treat other people you know it's all part of that it's all part of yourself um, and I think probably the truest reflection of who we are as a person is, is probably how we treat other people, mm -hmm. um, at least the most visible thing. Um, and I know some people, try, people maybe who aren't self-aware, I don't know why I'm pointing myself, I don't know how self-aware I really am, um, but people who, who aren't self-aware you know, may try to put on a front by helping other people, um, but you know, probably should be starting looking at themselves first of all. So I think it's definitely, you know, I'm not saying help yourself first and then help other people, but um, you definitely have to be aware of what you're doing. Um, yeah. And I definitely think that, you know, as you, as you probably mature as a person and mature in your faith, if you're not helping other people, then you have some serious questions to ask yourself. Um, and maybe a lot of people are running away from those questions. Yeah. But you know, that's that's such a clear thing right yeah. throughout scripture. Even that, that bit where um again reading from, from Timothy, where you know he's um he's sending them out and and so this is actually I, I got I had notes on this verse in my Bible and I looked up who, who said it because there was um there was a quote that I had written down and it was Neil um from a few years ago. Um so talking about Timothy and Paul, um, so we, what Neil said, thank you Neil, it was don't leave feeling that you've played it safe um, when you have the opportunity for something greater instead. Um, so don't, don't leave feeling that you've played it safe when you have the opportunity to do something greater. Do the work, fulfill your ministry. Do you even remember saying that? Doesn't sound like me at all. It, it's very, <laughs> I mean, it's very powerful. Um, uh, and then there was another there was another reference to look for where Jesus is reading um, and he says the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and then he rolled up the scroll and sat down and then my note says mic drop and um, which which I, I don't know if that was in Neil's original sermon or not um, but it's definitely one of those, you know, Jesus mic drop moments where it's just, it's just very simple. You know, it's, you know, God sent them to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering a sight to the blind, set liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Like, that's it. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Are you sure the mic drop wasn't a note you left for yourself to actually do this morning? No, no. no, no mic, Paul says no mic drops. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, and so whenever it comes to that treatment of others, I think again for me one of the one of those encounters, one of those moments of clear unveiling revelation was when so much of what John says in the in his first letter, First John, um, and I think it's chapter f chapter three or chapter four, where he says if you if you um, cannot love those that you can see, don't even try to say that you love a God that you can't. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh man, John, that like, so if you're worried about like, not that you, not that you were, but about harsh, about how clear cut that is about yeah. our treatment of others, well then take it up with, take it up with John. That's, that's like, that is, for me, that's just so powerful, so yeah. incredible. It's one of those, it's one of those measure, measuring sticks that I probably go back to and ask those really deep questions, really provoking questions. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so really quickly, I'll just finish off uh, with this quote from Anne Lamott that I shared with you. And uh, if you have anything more you want to say about this forgiveness or self-forgiveness that I ended with last week. Because um, Anne Lamott, I, read, I was reading her um, a couple of weeks back and she was reflecting on this seemingly improbable relationship between brokenness and joy. And she goes on to say, the lesson here is that there is no fix. There is, however, forgiveness. And to forgive our, yourselves and others constantly is necessary. Mm -hmm. not, not, not only is everyone screwed up, but everyone screws up. Yeah, yeah. And so, the, so of discovering that. joy is like, sometimes we think that our, our brokenness and our pain and all, all of that 
disqualify us from experiencing joy. But the lesson is that there is no fix, but there is forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And to forgive ourselves and others is just, it's just this constant necessity. And I think if you can't forgive yourself, uh, you can't really find joy. Mm. I mean, that, that's probably a reason for a lot of the problems people have. I, I don't know, I, I, my, I personally find it really hard to forgive myself for things. And I'm always telling, mean, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm always telling my children, you know, to apologize to each other, you know, f for whatever they've done. Um, but yet I'll still, like, hold myself to a standard in my head, of, you know, where I can't forgive myself for stuff that I've done or mm -hmm. stuff that I've said in the past. Um, so def we definitely have to be able to, to forgive ourselves yeah. um, and, and, and forgive others uh, you know, on our journey. Yeah. We, do, we make mistakes all oh, the time. Yeah. I think that's a good self-aware self piece because mm. you're acknowledging that and there's probably something in me acknowledging that, but I'm aware that I'm probably not qualified to take that conversation any further than just acknowledging it. Yeah, no, I don't <laughs> think I am either. <laughs> um, anything else? Anything else that's in your head that you just have to get out before yeah, we finish here? There's, there's some fly. It wasn't in your head, it was on it there for a while, yeah. stuck to that gel. Um, oh, that's not gel, that's just... Brill cream? No, I just, my hair just goes like that, it's through sheer willpower alone. Wow. No, it's cream. I'm coveting, um, <laughs> coveting my neighbour's hair here. Um, yeah, I, I definitely thought that, you know, when, um, first thing whenever you'd, you'd asked me to, to do this, after, after I thought, what was it about? last few weeks was, Guinness, those are some really difficult topics to start talking about, you know, identity and charity and forgiveness. I mean, yeah. <laughs> they're big concepts. Yeah. They definitely are. Yeah. The most important thing for me is that we're, like, I never want us to think that this is, we're taking these three topics and whoever sitting up here is providing the answers. Yeah. It's not that. It's like, it's just to sort of let people listen in in a conversation so that we can all be asking different questions together. So. And for me, I, I'm in some ways like you. Like I'm not, I'm not criticizing or judging you because you've forgotten what I've preached about. As like as much as that might pain me, that nothing I said was of any profundity that you remembered it by Wednesday. But I know for me, I hold on to it, having conversations. I'll hold on to learning in yeah. dialogue so much better than I will yeah. in monologue. Absolutely. And so for me, that's why we're trying to we're trying to do this, and uh, maybe not doing it wonderfully but we're giving it a go and um failures and pain and discovery and all of that is part of the journey that's it just feel a lot not lead to success brilliant there we go so <laughs> father we thank you for this time uh and thank you for that reminder that um that in spite of our weaknesses and failures that you have committed yourself to being with us and to being for us and to walking with us and um, oh, we, we, we thank you for that. Uh, we thank you for this reminder today of who we are in you. Nothing changes that. We are divine image bearers. Those that we come in contact with today are made in your image. Every person in this room and every person that we encounter throughout this day and this week are worth you giving your life for, Jesus. And so we agree with you on that about every person that we come in to contact with this week. And Jesus, we thank you for your unfailing love. We thank you that because of that reminder of who we are and who you are, we can be resilient when it's difficult. We can be resilient in the painful days, in the seasons of quietness and absence. Um, we thank you for that. We thank you for this opportunity that we have as carriers of the kingdom to be able to stand with those um those who are poor and oppressed and are marginalized and isolated we have the chance to demonstrate the kingdom to people like that uh, we thank you for andrew thank you for how he does that in his job we pray that you would challenge us all and how we can do that in the places and the spaces that we find ourselves in and god we just continue to to lean on you and we thank you for that prayer you've taught us to pray father and we we we, we reflect on that again in this moment. Father, would you forgive us uh, our mistakes as we forgive those who have made mistakes against us and uh, forgive us our sins, forgive us as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And, um, so yeah, God, just increase your self-awareness with some of this stuff that we've talked about. Uh, 
God help us to continue to discover, to ask questions, to be able to open ourselves toward you. Search me, God, know me. If there's any anxious, hidden thoughts, God, I just bring them out into the open. And we, uh, we, we hold them and we live them all out together. Uh, so bless the rest of our day. Thank you for it. And um, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thanks, everyone, um, for being with us this morning. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And please, really, I know Neville has already said it, but I'd love you to join with us tonight at 8.30 on Zoom as we continue just to have conversations that will improve our learning, improve our listening. Um, so, yeah, bless you all.